We'll go ahead and get started with an invocation by Councilwoman Renee Skidmore. Leadership requires two virtues that seem very simple until they become very inconvenient, honesty and courage. All of us have earned the right to be here today by winning the trust of the people of Erlanger. But along with that honor comes a duty of humility, integrity, and public service. So let's settle our hearts for just a moment of prayer. God of justice and mercy, thank you for the gift of life and the opportunity to serve the people of our city. Help us to act with character and conviction. Help us to listen with understanding and goodwill. Help us to speak with charity and restraint. Guide us to be the leaders of this city. Help us to see the humility, the humanity, and dignity of those who disagree with us, and to treat all persons, no matter how weak or poor, with the reverence your creation deserves. And finally, Lord, renew us with the strength of your presence and the joy of helping to build a community worthy of all of its citizens. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, with that, we'll call the meeting the uh, August 1st, 2017 regular council meeting to order. Please rise for a pledge of allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, Ms. Mrs. Hoffman, would you please take roll call? Mr. Burke? Here. Mr. Cahill? Ms. Kyle? Here. Mr. Skidmore? Here. Ms. Sudcamp? Here. Ms. Cahill? Here. Mr. Montgomery? Here. Ms. Skidmore? Here. Ms. Pitts? Here. Mr. Nicely? Here. Ms. Fetty? Here. Mr. Blankenship? Here. All right, we have a quorum. Uh, council, you've received a copy of the minutes for the July 18th, 2017 regular council meeting. Are there any additions or corrections to be made at this time? Seeing that none, I'll entertain a motion that they be accepted as written. Motion by Mrs. Kyle, second by Mrs. Fetty. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Motion carried. All right, you've received a copy of the agenda for tonight's meeting, August 1st, 2017, regular council meeting. Are there any additions to be made at this time? Seeing none, I'll entertain that we accept the agenda as written. Motion by Mrs. Kyle. Second by Mrs. Fetty. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Motion carried. All right, we'll move on to the special presentation then. Uh, first, we've got uh, Duke Energy here this evening. Thank you, Mayor. Rhonda Whitaker, Director of uh, Government and Community Relations here for Duke Energy Kentucky, and my associate Tracy Tinsley, who's our Project Director, director for Midwest Meter Deployment. And we're here to talk to you tonight about smart meter deployment in northern Kentucky, which is coming to your neighborhood very shortly. So Tracy is going to give the uh, overall presentation. Just briefly, I want to tell you that Duke Energy, of course, is always looking and planning for growth on our system. Um, as you all know, we've got a lot of economic development growth occurring in northern Kentucky. We have aged infrastructure. We're always looking at the need to replace infrastructure, make sure it's safe and reliable for our customers. And in addition, new technology that creates a lot of advances and benefits for customers. Um, so one of the things that we're talking about tonight is new technology that does provide a lot of great benefits for our customers. And you'll get to hear a little bit about that here in a second. Um, we've had a lot going on in this community, as we all know, the growth of Amazon uh, coming to our community, a lot of uh, industrial customers expanding. <coughs> And Duke's excited about that, but we always do have to ensure that we are maintaining our system and, and growing our system to meet that load. And so a lot of times some of the projects we have, have going on, whether it's electric or gas, uh, means a lot of construction activity in your neighborhoods. And we appreciate your patience. We know that's not easy, but 
you know, it's a, it's a necessity in order to keep up with all of this growth. So you're going to see even here some substation improvements right across the street coming up in the next year or so. Um, and again, we just ask for your patience. Uh, we try to get through those projects as quickly as possible, but um, we know it's, it can be difficult uh, when we have to, you know, work on closing roads or shutting them down for a while. We'll get back to communicate with all of you about the substation project, but for now, we're here to talk about smart meters and can't wait for you to hear about this new program that Duke is finally instituting with the approval of the Public Service Commission as of May this year. So with that, I'll turn it over to Tracy. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to get in front of you guys and just give you a brief update. I promise it'll be brief about the project that we're getting ready to do. We did recently get approval from the public commission and we will be touching every Duke Energy customer in our Kentucky footprint. So it's important because anytime there's questions or the unknown, uh, you guys will get asked as well as, you know, other folks, elected officials. So we want to make sure we have the opportunity to let you know what we're doing and why we're doing it. Briefly, this slide has a lot of words, as do several of my slides. I'm just going to hit a couple of highlights. We are rolling out advanced meters, smart meters, for two big reasons. One is to give customers more options. Today, we currently uh, collect a meter read once a month, and a consumer only gets to see two weeks later what their usage was, and they may not be able to tie it back to what they're doing. When we put a smart meter in, folks will be able to see yesterday's data today. So if they want to see their daily usage, they'll be able to do that. They'll have choices such as being able to pick their own due date. We won't be tied to the meter reader cycle anymore. They'll also be able to get usage alerts, very similar to you get with a cellular uh, connection of, you know, your usage is hitting this percent or this dollar amount. So there's a lot of options that as soon as we put the meter in and it's reading reliably, customers will be able to get a benefit from. We we also have benefits on the operational side and that today we have a lot of indoor meters in Kentucky. We also have a lot of meter readers, you know, having to punch in reads. And so we do get some estimated bills, some bill corrections due to human error or due to just not being able to access the meter. So once we have the smart meter in, it will communicate with us every night so we'll be able to get the data and not have to access the premise, therefore reducing the estimated bills and errors. Today, we have mostly walk-by meters in Kentucky. What we're jumping to is all the way at the bottom, the smart meter that communicates two ways. We do um, see a lot of utilities go with an AMR meter, which only communicates one way, but it does require a meter driver to come by once a month and still get a read. A lot of water companies have gone with this, and we will be using that solution in our gas-only areas. Duke has um, some service, some customers that we only serve the gas to, so we'll be, we, we'll be doing the AMR solution there. This is just a picture of the devices we're installing, a meter, which is what everybody already knows, a gas module on the end on top of the meter. We will not be exchanging any gas meters as part of this project. And then a, a communication device that will collect all of the data. It all works together to be able to gather the energy consumption, send it every night back into our systems, and then that's when the opportunity opens up that customers can see yesterday's data today, and we can offer all sorts of programs because we have daily data instead of monthly data. Yes, the, the grid router, the new device that we're installing, we're installing about 120 of those in Kentucky, and they will all be installed on poles we already own, Duke Energy already owns, and um, so they will be on our existing infrastructure. There will be a little bit of work that folks will see while those go up, but it won't disrupt any power or cause any other problems. But those 120 devices are really important because they'll be the ones that collect almost all of the data uh, that send it back through a cellular connection every night back to our systems. Just to let you know, our service territory, the map might be hard to read, in Kentucky is made up of the gold, green, and blue dots. Green is Kenton County mostly. To the left, the gold is Boone County, and to the right is Campbell County. We've made the decision we're starting in Kenton County, uh, so we will be starting with the green first. The legend at the bottom basically throws out the months that will be in there. So Kenton County will start in September. We're, we're actually going to start August 28th. 
and run through about March. And then we'll move to Boone County. We'll have some overlap starting in February and then Campbell County starting in May or June. I can't even read that myself. But we will finish with this project in a year. So in September of next year, we'll have touched all of our residents in Kentucky. Very important is to let folks know we have a lot of touch points with customers. So recently we just put a bill insert for customers that get manual bills uh, or, or paper bills. There, there was a bill insert that explained smart meters are coming. We want to be very transparent about this. As well as the customers have a choice if they really don't want a smart meter. Uh, the commission also approved an opt-out policy that allows us to opt a customer out of a smart meter. It does have a monthly fee associated with it. So that information is on the bill insert that went out. If you get your bill electronically, there's actually a way you can look at your bill inserts. I know a lot of people don't. They just want to pay it. But that's out there also electronically. We're trying to get out in front of folks also to let them know because we know paper gets lost in the mail or lost in your inbox sometimes. But we did do the bill insert. Before we actually come to your premise, we'll mail a postcard, and that postcard has uh, one very important fact on it, and that is the person that comes to exchange your meter will be identified clearly as a contractor for Duke Energy. We know the utility company has a lot of folks, a lot of scams that are run against you know, utilities, so we want to make sure all of our customers know that the trucks will be labeled, Grid One Services, a contractor for Duke Energy, or Duke Energy, if it's a Duke Energy performer. Most of our work will be performed by the contractor. Uh, we also will have a badge on all of the folks. So if, if somebody comes to your door and can't show you the badge, turn them away. Say no. They will be, they will be clearly identified. They will come and try knock on the door. If you're there, they will let you know they're getting ready to exchange the meter. If you're not and they can access the meter, if it's outside and easily accessible, they'll go ahead and change it and leave a door hanger on your door. Um, if you're not there or if the meter's inside, we'll leave another door hanger that says, hey, we need to set up an appointment with you. And then we'll also try to call you and set that appointment up. So we go through several touch points to try to get in and exchange the meter. Once the meter's exchanged, it typically is anywhere between three and 10 days before we know it's reading good and, and it will get certified and get taken out of the meter reader's route. At that point, you'll get another mailing, and it's actually uh, a reminder, hey, now that you have a smart meter, you can see your daily usage, you can pick your own due date, you'll get usage alerts and other things that will be coming to you. So part of our communication path. And then finally, I do want to mention that Duke Energy is rolling out smart meters across multiple jurisdictions. And we have worked on our external website to have a presence that explains some of the frequently asked questions we get as a project team or as a company about our smart meters and, and how they're installed and some of the uh, potential concerns folks might have with them. So I think that's all I have. I don't know if there's any questions. Yes. Um, no, well, eventually there might be. I mean, there's not a charge when you get a smart meter. Everything Duke Energy does is put into a rate case. So we actually have some things that go down each year, some things that go up. And um, as Duke builds its rate cases to go in, we have to net all of those and show them to the commission. So this project will be just like any other project. It'll be put into that rate case requesting recovery at some point for some of the dollars. But there's no charge, like if you get a smart meter in September, there's no adder to your bill because of it. Any other questions? Oh, I'm sorry, yes. Oh, that's okay. I just wanted you to know that I had mine installed today. Oh, really? And, and I just want to tell everybody that it was very painless. Yay! <laughs> um, the gentleman was only there for about 15 minutes. Okay. And when he was ready to leave, I said, so my bill's cut in half, right? <laughs> and, and he said, no, but had I put it in backwards, they would have been paying you. I said, oh, now uh, you tell me. <laughs> he was a delightful young man. Thank and, you. We and appreciate it was that very kind of feedback. painless. So okay. I just want everybody to know that it's very quick and easy. We really appreciate that feedback. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, does that mean the fee will come off for reading the meter then? Oh, I'm what not. The will the fee come off for read the meter? The, I'm oh, not sure. Well, okay. So. Um, <laughs> Great question. <laughs> That's a complex one. We may have to get back to you on that, Kathy. <laughs> but I would say this. The reason we also did an opt-out provision uh, that the commission wanted to make sure that we provided, 
you know, part of this new infrastructure allows us not to have meter readers coming out, you know, to your, to all these individual premises. And so, um, if customers do opt out, they get a charge, a monthly charge, if they don't want a smart meter, it's $25 a month, because then we do have to pay meter readers to come out manually. And so, you know, we, we don't want to have to do that, but we understand if a customer is really adamant about not wanting that meter, then we certainly understand that, um, but there does have to be a charge for that. So, um, yeah, I'm not, I, we may have to look into exactly what your question is entailing, but I think, um, you know, that, that we can get back to you on, okay? I do, I, every uh, month when my husband gets our bill, his biggest gripe is, here, I'm going to walk my tail out there, read it, and send it in to oh. them. But, but it's still, even if you do it yourself, they still charge you a meter reader fee. Yeah. So since you're not going to use yeah, them. Yeah. I mean, I want to say probably not, but I don't want to say that incorrectly. So we'll, we'll get back to you and answer that question. That's a great question. Yeah. And yes, Renee. What did you say about the gas module? Did you say something about that? Yes, yeah, so for all of the Duke Energy gas meters, we'll be putting a module on them. We won't be exchanging the gas meter. That's already exchanged as regulated by the commission. Every nine years, we are required to exchange the gas meter. We're simply putting a module on it, and that module then collects data and sends it over the network like I showed. So you'll be able to go online and see your gas usage every day. So you'll see yesterday's usage today if you want to. The, the electric meter, the smart meter, allows you to see hourly Correct. usage. The gas meter can only allow you to see daily usage. Correct. But again, all of that's very different from what customers receive today. And if you're a gas-only customer, though, if that's where your question was going, then a gas-only customer, there's no electric meter network, communications network, for the gas reading to ride over. So the gas-only customers will get an AMR module. And what that means, it's still a module on the meter. There won't be a meter reader, though, that comes to the house. They'll just drive by the house and pick up the reading. Okay, my question was going to be, though, um, if you have gas that you use, like, in the winter, but you don't use it in the summer, you still pay a fee to have it available. Yes. That's an availability Yeah, that, that's an unchanged, correct. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other? Do we have a question in the audience? Absolutely not. <laughs> so it is two-way communication, but it's kind of like baby monitors. I mean, you're just getting data, sending data. So we can do a read. We can actually do a remote connect and disconnect for, and this is really important for apartment managers or commun uh, college communities that have a lot of move in and move outs. We can do that without having to coordinate it with the homeowner. I mean, we do coordinate for the phone call, but we can perform the command without sending the truck if we need to. So, but we don't, we don't do anything else. We're just getting the data from the, the meter. Yeah, I wasn't sure if it was like some of the optional programs that are yeah. not scheduling. Mm -mm. Be... We're, we're not implementing those at this time. Now, there could be some of those that would be optional, but, but it would be like a, a, your Bluetooth. You would have to say, I want into that and I want to pair to that. Right now, that none of that is it, on the plans. It, it's kind of like, some of you may be participating with what we call power manager where you allow us to regulate for peak times in the summer your air conditioning, but that's something that you have to sign up for, and we work with you on how that program works, so we wouldn't just automatically regulate. Yeah. Yep. Okay. okay. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank, thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you for taking your time. Thank you. Yeah. All right, next we've got um, Nicely's Appliance Repair and HVAC. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and the council for letting us come here and talk a little bit about our business. We appreciate that. Um, apparently, I didn't get the message about what color shirt to wear. So I guess communication is not our best, our best thing. Um, this is my sister, Diane. She's our office manager. It's my brother, Steve. Uh, we started our business in 92, or actually Steve and my dad started it in 92. And um, after college, I joined them for what was going to be a temporary venture. Uh, the temporary venture turned out to be 23 years. So I guess it's relative. Um, 
we started in a garage, and over the time, we've changed locations a couple times. Our first location was um, the old Unicorns Garden building that many of you know of. Um, used to be Harry Carl's and his wife's residence way back in the day. Uh, we added on to that building after a couple years, and then back in 08, we moved into our current location, which is at 11 Price, um, right by Dixie Chili. Used to be the Lutheran Church, I think, way back, uh, way back when. Um, so we... Um, Along the way, Diane joined us to be our office manager, and then um, we've evolved. We start out just serving uh, appliances. Now we service heating and cooling. We sell parts to the do-it-yourselfer. I've seen a couple of you guys come in for that. Uh, we actually have one of the largest parts inventories in the area. Um, we're very proud of that. And then back in the winter, we added dryer vent cleaning. So if anybody needs that, prevent a house fire, we do that also. Um, so little bit about us and about our history, what we do, um, and then some of our community support that we do, because we do feel like the community has been very good to us, and we feel like we should support the community. So um, the three counties that, that we serve, Boone, Kenton, and Campbell, so those are where we put your dollars back when you come to us. Um, some of the business are the charities that we support, um, Holly Hill Family Services, they're out in Campbell County, uh, the Women's Crisis Center, uh, Redwood School, and then a couple of our, I guess, closer wins, um, since right here in our neighborhood, uh, Lloyd High School, uh, Diane and myself are on the Alumni Association board. Uh, we raise money for scholarships, and through the efforts that the board does, and of course a lot of our members, we give out $16,000 a year in scholarships. So we're very proud of that also. Um, and then kind of my pet project, um, I like working with therapy pets. So we support therapy pets of Greater Cincinnati. Um, and we have therapy pets of our own, and we help um, train therapy pets for other people and help them get certified, and in particular, rescue animals, um, pound puppies and things like that. It's kind of where we want to specialize. And then we take ours to nursing homes throughout Boone County and uh, Kenton County. Um, so that's a little bit about what we do. Um, keep it brief. Um, but I do want to say we do hold every spring and every fall we call it a customer appreciation day. I guess it really should be more titled a community appreciation day because you don't have to be a customer um, to participate. But we do a car show, live music, free food, uh, Dixie Chili Coney's, so uh, support a neighboring business too. Um, we do it in the spring and fall. The next one will be October. Uh, tentatively, it's for the first Sunday in October. I believe that's October 1st. So maybe the city could even get that on their uh, Facebook page or their website. We would appreciate that. It's completely free. Anybody is welcome to attend. Um, anybody have any questions or anything? Thanks again for having us up here. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thank, thank you. you, guys, and thanks for your all service. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Next, it looks like we've got a dispatch accreditation, Mr. Leonard. Good evening. I uh, just want to let you know we want to present to you our dispatch accreditation we received uh, last week. Lieutenant Jansing picked it up. Oh, you're back there. Lieutenant Jansing picked it up at the Kentucky Association of Chiefs of Police. Just give you a little overview of what this entailed. Uh, the Kentucky Association of Chiefs of Police started this process in 1998 to set a standard for law enforcement to follow. Uh, dispatch was added in 2014. Again, just to have a comprehensive set of standards for communication centers to follow. There are 60 standards that had to be met broken down into 12 categories. The categories are authority and organization, direction, personnel and personnel alternatives, fiscal management and agency-owned property, complaint and disciplinary procedures, training and career development, public information and community relations, dispatch operations, field unit communications, facilities and equipment, records, and last unusual occurrences. Uh, Erlanger Dispatch started this process in September of 2016 and completed it in June of 2017. Now, this accreditation process greatly strengthened our dispatch policies and procedures which were in need of revision at the time. This achievement could not have been accomplished without the research assistance and knowledge of dispatchers Lonnie Reese and Shirley Brown who are with us tonight especially the policy knowledge assistance from Lieutenant Mike Chansing. 
He spearheaded the policy revisions of the dispatch center that were required to receive this accreditation. I'd also like to thank Sherry Hoffman, Steve Bodie, and Missy Andrus for their assistance with gathering information needed to complete this process. And lastly, I'm proud to say that we are only the 13th communication center in the Commonwealth to receive this out of 120 plus centers. Wow. Wow, that's awesome. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, we've got the bronze award for Mission Lifeline. Jeff Gaylor, welcome. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Thanks so much for the opportunity to speak here tonight. My name is Jeff Gaylor. I'm the Senior Director of Health Strategies for the American Heart Association. And today, uh, we're going to celebrate the outstanding level of heart attack care uh, being delivered to the residents and businesses in the city of Erlanger. And this is the best part of my day, being able to talk about Live Save, being able to talk about the great work of fire and EMS professionals in front of the community stakeholders, in front of the council members. So this is the best part of my Tuesday, I think it is today. Um, so the American Heart Association recognizes the critical life-saving role EMS provides to the overall success of heart attack systems of care. The correct tools and training allow EMS providers to rapidly identify a heart attack, promptly notify the destination center, and activate an early response by hospital personnel. As an EMS agency that delivers education in heart attack identification, provides access to 12 lead ECG machines, and develops protocols derived by the AHA heart attack guideline recommendations, your pre-hospital professionals are driving improvements in the care of heart attack patients. Beyond these basic components of a high-functioning heart attack system of care, the City of Erlanger Fire and EMS is part of an elite group of pre-hospital agencies in the United States focused not just on high-functioning, but also high-quality heart attack systems of care. The City of Erlanger Fire and EMS joins 627 other EMS agencies across the country and is only one of 20 in the state of Kentucky that are receiving the 2017 American Heart Association Mission Lifeline and EMS Performance Achievement Award. Wow. Yeah. So to achieve the Bronze Performance Achievement Award, the City of Erlanger Fire and EMS achieved a 75% or higher compliance score for each specific EMS quality measure for three to nine months. These measures include percentage of patients with chest pain treated and transported by EMS who received a pre-hospital 12 lead, the ability to identify a heart attack, and the percentage of heart attack patients transported to a heart attack receiving center with a pre-hospital medical medical contact time to device within 90 minutes. The most deadly type of heart attack is called a STEMI. And what the AHA and American College of Cardiology guidelines say that opening up a blocked vessel uh, within 90 minutes provides the best chance of survival from the most deadly kind of heart attack. So prompt response, timely treatment from your pre-hospital fire and EMS professionals is key to surviving. So today that means we're celebrating lives saved because of the hard work and dedication of the city of Erlanger Fire and EMS. The community served and businesses, residents uh, served by the city of Erlanger should be very proud of their pre-hospital care professionals. For their accomplishment, we'll be recognizing them throughout the year at professional meetings and professional journals and on the American Heart Association website. So I'll call members up and on behalf of the staff and volunteers of the American Heart Association, I'd like to present the city of Erlanger Fire and EMS with the American Heart Association's Mission Lifeline 2017 EMS Bronze Performance Achievement Award. Congratulations. Thank you very much, Mr. Gaylor. All right, next we've got the oath of office ceremony for Brian Brownfield. I'll do an introduction before okay. we swear in. Is that okay? Wonderful. Step on up here, Mr. Brownfield. Brian Brownfield was included on our, in our last recruitment and orientation class. That class totaled six individuals for five positions. 
Um, we as an organization decided it best to go ahead and run him through and fulfill those orientation requirements as a part-time employee. Because we decided to do that, it allows us to introduce him tonight as a full-time employee. Brian is a 2014 graduate of Ludlow High School. 2014, wow. Yeah. It's like, I'm getting younger, or they're getting, I don't know what it is. I guess I am really old right now. They get younger and younger. He earned his associate's degree in fire service technology from Cincinnati State. His EMT certification from Gateway Community College. And this month, he will graduate from Cincinnati State with his paramedic certification. Brian works part-time for the Deerfield Township fire, excuse me, fire Department in Ohio and with the Ludlow Fire Department here locally. You know, Brian was patient. He's done everything asked of him. And those are the behaviors that we hope continue as we welcome him as a full-time firefighter slash EMT slash soon-to-be paramedic with our department. Brian. Brittany's girlfriend will be holding the Bible during the swearing-in ceremony. All right. I ask you to raise your right hand. All right. Okay, I'll go ahead and, and recite the oath, and then you'll say I do at the end. I, Brian Brownfield, do solemnly swear to do my duty as a firefighter EMT for the city of Erlanger to the best of my ability, to serve my commanding officers with the with respect and dignity to serve the citizens of the city of Erlanger with compassion, courage, and integrity, and to uphold the laws and constitutions of the United States of America, the Commonwealth of Kentucky, and the city of Erlanger. So help me God. All right, welcome. All right, next up we've got uh, the mayor's report. I'll make this brief. I did want to recognize several members who completed the MRF challenge last month. The, uh, the MRF challenge is uh, a tribute to Michael Murphy, a um, um, Iraq war veteran, um, and uh, was also a trainer. This is a national challenge uh, that was put together by members of our uh, police department. Greg Ayler, Jason Whaley, Tom Lose, Chief Whitaker, Glenn Bailey, Jim White, and Emily Durrett all completed a one-mile run, 100 pull-ups, 200 push-ups, 300 squats, and another one-mile run. So quite an accomplishment. It was amazing to see. Um, the... Um, the next thing I wanted to introduce uh, members of the procurement committee. We've got uh, four of the seven members here in attendance this evening. Uh, we've got Joe Durrett, T.D. Durker, um, David Clegg, and Adam Davey. And uh, who we don't have here this evening are Bonnie Kirkwood, Matt Pachinski, and Jeremy Armbruster. If you guys wouldn't mind standing up and introducing yourselves to the, to the council. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And um, I wanted to give everybody an update, too. The selection committee have, has begun their interview process for the city administrator. That began today. And that's all I had to report this evening. So then moving on, we've, we'll move to the reports of committees. We've got public safety, police, Mrs. Sudcamp. Mrs. Kyle? Uh, yes. Um, first of all, I just have some highlights. All of our officers took the PT test in July, and officers and teachers from Lloyd participated in an active shooter training. Um, Officer Wojcik investigated an indoor marijuana grow operation that was discovered after a house fire. 
and Officer Day was awarded a Governor's Award for seatbelt and child restraint violations for the past year. In the Criminal Investigation Division, uh, six cases were assigned and one background check was assigned. Nine cases were closed. Uh, Detective Lose was busy during much of the month with his role as the fitness instructor, which we just discussed, and initiated a new procedure to insist, assist in case investigation and evaluation of detectives. The community resource officer attended the Optimus Club, met with the Erlanger Historical Society for Heritage Day. Erlanger Police Honor Guard presented the colors before the Cincinnati Reds game at the American Ballpark, filled in for Crime Stoppers Vice President Gene Bishop at the BNI Group, and hosted the July Erlanger hosted the July Crime Stoppers meeting on the 14th. He also participated in the 2017 Police Fitness Test. The canine units received their yearly vaccinations. There were two training days this month, and training has been conducted at Wild flavors to avoid increased travel times due to the construction on the bridge. What construction? We all know. <laughs> <laughs> A new supply of narcotic training aids was received from the DEA <clears throat> and old narcotics have been destroyed. Bike officers were limited on patrol this month due to field training responsibilities. However, you all need to know that they're very effective in doing traffic stops on Halbert Avenue, address complaints from citizens. They've located multiple unsecured businesses during the overnight hours. The uh, bike units were also instrumental in arrest of two subjects on two separate occasions where the suspects were on foot in dense areas where patrol cars could not access. The bike units ensured a timely and safe arrest of each suspect. And Assistant Chief is in the house. All right, thank you. All right, next we've got uh, fire EMS, Mrs. Pitts, Mrs. Fetty. Um, our fire department was pretty busy this month. They had a lot of training, some of it um, with simulation mannequins, um, others with coordination of fighting fires while ventilating gases or dangerous toxins to try to minimize that while they're fighting the fires. Um, all three shifts did a walkthrough at the Sun Behavioral Health Center during their construction so they can start getting familiarized with their layout. Um, Chief Whitaker and Assistant Chief McQuarrie attended the International Association of Fire Chiefs Conference in North Carolina. Um, the fire department also received some new CPAP equipment for the ambulances to better treat patients. The old ones were bulky masks that wasted a lot of oxygen. Um, they also did some fire extinguisher training along with 43 life safety inspections for the month of July. They were also um, involved in the community. Um, they participated in the Edgewood Parade. They also participated in um, Rainbow Child Care and A.J. Linneman where the kids were able to climb on the equipment while the members were doing demonstrations for the kids, which they always love. Um, they attended the Florence Freedom for Stand Up for the Red, White, and Blue, where all local first responders were recognized for their service. Um, also, um, just in case anybody in Erlanger didn't know this, Erlanger Fire Department offers free CPR classes for all Erlanger residents and businesses, and these classes are offered once a month. Um, the Fire Department EMS had 350 responses for the month of July. And this isn't, this is just kind of cool to me or anybody who lives on the east side of town. Um, fire departments are known for designing emblems for their particular firehouse. So Rick Bowl created one for Firehouse 3. And anybody on the east side of town will find this humorous. Um, it's a cow that has, it's dressed as a firefighter and it pays homage to the cows who used to get loose from the list farm and walk up and down Narrows Road. And anybody who lives there probably had these cows somewhere on the road or in their front yard like I did. So um, that's pretty cool. And Chief Whitaker's in the house. All right, thank you. All right, next then we've got Public Works. Mr. Skidmore. <clears throat> yes, on July 31st uh, was uh, <clears throat> Rodney Snow's, Snow's last day. Um, and we hope he enjoys his retirement. Um, I'd like to thank everybody that participated in these little um, 
uh, party they had here for him. He really appreciated it. And that's all I have. Mr. Darty's in the house. Do you have anything? Oh, thank you. All right, thank you. Then administration, Mrs. Skidmore, Mrs. Cahill. Tonight under legislation, there will be the first reading of the tax rate ordinance that reflects the 2% decrease that was included in the fiscal year 18 budget. The general government offices will be closed on Monday, September the 4th in observance of Labor Day. And 1,653 people attended the Depot Days programs over the summer. They had a program, I guess it was last week, about the eclipse and they let the kids, they had this circle and they let the, there was like perforated dots in there that you could poke through and you could hold it up and you could find the constellations in the sky and it would make like the Big, the big Dipper, the Little Dipper, Orion's, what, whatever all those constellations are. It's actually pretty neat. My grandson was actually focused for 10 minutes. <laughs> um, members of the, and this is, this is very important too, members of the interim joint committee on local government were told it's time that Kentucky let government, local governments publish online instead of doing it in the newspaper. State law requires various documents to be published in a local newspaper, but the Kentucky League of Cities and other groups testified that the rule is unnecessarily costly when social media and government websites get more traction. And this would actually save the city of Erlanger about $4,000. And the total property taxes collected this month was $10,570.54. And the total collected for tax year 2016 was $4,116,279.27. And we're still owed $49,000 plus on the year 2016. Passports, we had 38 processed this month. Does that collect that? equals out to $950. And since it's the beginning of the fiscal year, those numbers stay the same year to date and this month are the same. And code enforcement citations, $14,280.23. Again, it's the same fiscal year. So the month and the year to date, the fiscal year are the same. And the museum reported 183 visitors to Depot Museum. I have the uh, up and coming dates. <clears throat> this evening, the, uh, excuse me, the Madcap Puppets are at the Depot Park right now from 6 to 8. And on, uh, on August the 3rd, the Star Party at Frank's Flagship Park. It starts at 9 p.m. The planets are out. Members from the Cincinnati Conservatory will bring their telescopes to Flagship Park to view the giant planet Jupiter and the ring planet Saturn, as well as the waxing moon. The city will provide glow necklaces for all the kids. Then, uh, that's, uh, then on August the 10th, we have the Grateful Dance concert at Flagship Park. It's from 7 to 9 p.m. Head out to Flagship Park and enjoy your favorite local band, the Grateful Dance. They will be rocking the neighborhood with all your summer favorites. Kona Ice will be available for purchase, and the city will provide free popcorn and drinks. And one of the Grateful Dads used to be a Atlanta city councilman. Um, Hammond, Mr. Hammond, is a Grateful Dad. And on 815 Erlanger night at Silver Lake, it's 6 to 9. Cool off on a hot summer night and enjoy the wonderful outdoor amenities that Silver Lake has to offer. Concession will be available for purchase. This event is for Erlanger residents only. You must show proof of residency, residency at entrance. All participants will need to fill out a liability waiver. Children under 18 need to be accompanied by an adult. And then on August the 24th, Shakespeare in the Park will be the Merry Wives of Windsor, and that starts at 7 p.m. Join us as the Cincinnati Shakespeare Company presents Merry, Windsor, Merry Wives of Windsor. Please bring a blanket or lawn chair. Free popcorn and punch will be provi provided. Lots of great events happening in Erlanger. All right. Sherry Hoffman. I Anything have further? Sir. Okay, thank you. All right, the next we have, <clears throat> excuse me, finance and business development. Mr. Blankenship, Mr. Montgomery. Thank you. <coughs> the staff is continuing the process of closing the fiscal year 2017 and preparing the uh, records for the annual audit. 
uh, due to the large number of general ledger adjustments this year for the year end closing. The June and July financial statements are not yet ready. They'll be ready in September. And the auditors are going to be here conducting their field work October 9 through the 11th. That's all I have for me. Steve? Nothing further. Thank you. All right, thank you. The next we've got buildings, uh, excuse me, codes, building, and zoning. Mr. Burke, Mr. Nicely? Yes, sir. Um, Dave sent out reports for, for uh, building and zoning. You all should have received an email on that. If you got any questions, get a hold of Dave. And we would like to call a committee meeting to discuss the uh, Airbnb on the 15th. And another, we'd like to request a, another meeting also, a uh, uh, tax amendment, amendment. You might want to build uh, two family houses, so we'd like to uh, meet on that also. They want to amend the uh, zone okay. to do that, so we'd like to discuss that. All right. So I've, I've you want to discuss that on the 15th? 15th? Okay. Yes. Thank you. I don't like that. So are we supposed to swim first? <laughs> That's in conflict of the um, event. The event. The swimming event. Oh. August 15th. <laughs> sure. Oh. So we're supposed to swim first and then come in? Yeah, I'd rather swim. You don't want to see me in a swimsuit. <laughs> And All right. Mr. Hahn. Mr. Hahn. Is in the house. All right. Thank you. Thank yes. you. I have a question for David. Okay. They're doing some work down there on the old Aldi's building. Do we know what's actually going to go in there? Mm -hmm. I know what we thought was going to go in there, but. Mm -hmm. That was purchased a couple years ago by an outfit that. That the realtor didn't want anyone to know just yet, so it, they just recently got their permits. It's a, it's a funeral home, is what it's going to be. It was purchased uh, by an out-of-state uh, company, and they're coming in to, to open up a, a funeral home at that location. It's in the zone that's a permitted use, so they didn't need any of any kind of amendments or anything. So. Mm -hmm. If they choose to do a crematory, will they have to do something else with the zoning, or if is that included? The, they, they, they probably wouldn't have to do anything per the zoning. There's requirements, uh, state requirements of what they have to do, but at this point they're not, it's my understanding that that's not what they're planning on doing, of having as a part of this. All right, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. business. All right. Everybody's dying to go. Yeah. All right. So you've heard the reports of our committees. <laughs> Do I entertain a motion that would they be adopted as presented? Motion by Mrs. Kyle, second by Mrs. Sudkamp. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Motion carried. <clears throat> All right. Do we have any reports of representatives this evening? Mrs. Skidmore. Kent County Alliance. This was the um, first meeting that our new person in charge was at. <coughs> Lisa Anglin actually got a job with the, um, I think I told you about that the last time, that she got a job at St. E Hospital, and she's going to be kind of doing the same thing, but it's going to be for like more money instead of just a stipend. And the lady's name that's actually taking over now and trying to fill um, Lisa's place is Diana O'Toole, and she's with the Erlanger Kentucky Schools. And actually, I almost, I got there for the last five minutes because I was doing interviews here at the city building and I haven't perfected a way of being two places at once, which I'm sure some people are happy about that. But <laughs> anyway, um, we have, it's a free 24 seven support for people in crisis and it's actually a text line. So it says the text number is 741741. Is any type of crisis, anytime, anywhere in the United States, a live trained crisis counselor receives the text and responds quickly. Oh, that's cool. That should be on our so. website, Mayor. Can I yeah. see a picture of that? Sure. That's awesome. That's a great that's idea. Awesome. <clears throat> any other reports? This is Kyle? Yes, the Erlanger Historical Society. Um, <clears throat> they've been busy for the, it's been a busy summer for the volunteers at the Depot Museum. Um, the Depot days um, are Tuesday and Thursday 
at the Depot Park, so you can go either of those two days. Um, and they're preparing for a yard sale on this Saturday, August the 5th. So remember to clean out your attic and basement and bring your unwanted articles to the museum on Tuesday, Thursday, or Saturday this week. Um, last year they raised about $300, and I think that they want to do that again this year if they can. Um, I'm sorry. I, uh, in regards to that, how exactly does that work? Does, yard sale? All, does all of the monies go to the depot? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. You donate it to them. That's awesome. Yeah, That's yeah and if people donate items, you know, that, that helps sure them even more. Yeah, right. I didn't know if it was a 50-50 split or if it all went to the depot or what. I think it all goes to the depot. Yeah. I'm pretty sure. $300 doesn't yeah. sound like very much. No. Well, I don't know how well attended it is or, you know, how much people know about it. But if you can come or donate, uh, we would really appreciate it. And then plus, uh, we're working on a presentation for August 22nd at the Erlanger Library. And this is really cool. It's the Civil War era in Erlanger and Ellesmere. Um, that's the topic. With all aspects of the lives of the generation living through those times. Uh, the history of the war in the area, the homes, the clothing, the census of 1860, the food, the entertainment, the money, the transportation. So come and join us at the library on August 22nd, where we will also have artifacts from the Civil War era, and they also have a Civil War impersonator there. And uh, they're also going to videotape that whole program so that it can be shown on cable TV. I don't know which channel, but... What time is it? Um, this is... You know, they don't have a time on here. I don't, really don't know. We need to find out so we can get it on our website. Because that's 22nd. Uh, August 22nd. Maybe, um, well, I mean, I can find out before then and tell you at the yeah. meeting on August 15th, but I, I don't really remember. I I think we reported it last month. And I, I think don't it's remember. a seven. But Joe will get that word out. I think it's okay, a will you? Yeah. What time? I think it's seven. 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 Mm -hmm. That sounds about right, yeah. And then, uh, of course, Heritage Days is September 17th, and all the vendor letters were sent out, and we're already receiving several community and craft and food booth rentals. And this year, they're uh, sponsoring a photo contest. I don't know all the rules, so don't ask me. But um, you're supposed to discover the city of Erlanger, do a walking tour, and join our photo contest. Pick up the info at the Erlanger Depot Museum, and again, it's open Tuesdays and Thursdays and Saturday. Tuesdays and Thursdays, it's noon to 3. And then Saturday, it's noon until 5. So you can get all the information you need. Do that first, then take your photo. And then you email it to the historical at the city of Erlanger.com. Is that right? I think so. It says Erlanger at city of Erlanger. Isn't it Erlanger? I mean, isn't it a historical society? I don't know. Yeah. Well, we need to get that on the website, too. Do, do you know their email? Okay, put it on there. And you need to do that by September the 4th. And the photos are going to be hung at the Historical Society booth on Heritage Days. So you can see those. Um, and there's going to be first, second, and third place ribbons and prizes. And then um, the other thing is they, they're going to start working on their inventory again when fall comes because in the summer they're pretty busy. Um, and it's a known fact that if you have your inventory published on the website that you actually get more visitors. So that's one of their goals. They want to do that. Um, and the next meeting, I know we announced this at the last meeting, but I'll announce it again, is August the 9th, next week. Uh, we're going to meet at the Depot Museum on Crescent to carpool to the Tolliver Home um, at tour of the history.